Welcome to this short video on understanding hybrid MPI and OpenMP performance. It's brought to you by me, Mark Bull, and my colleague Holly Judge from EPCC at the University of Edinburgh in the UK. So hybrid MPI plus OpenMP applications are becoming increasingly common on high performance computing systems. And that's because compared to pure MPI, it can both reduce the memory usage and or improve the scalability of the application. And from a programming point of view, the semantics of combining MPI and OpenMP are really quite straightforward. And that's especially true if there are no MPI calls inside OpenMP parallel regions. However, we need to choose how many OpenMP threads to run per MPI process. And the performance is a complex trade-off between multiple sources of overhead, and it can be really difficult to identify any optimization opportunities. So let's start by looking at some of the potential advantages of combining MPI with OpenMP. First of all, one of the important motivations might be to reduce the overall memory usage. This is because we can get by with fewer copies of replicated data structures. So this might be some large global data structure which is replicated across all MPI processes. Or it might just be a function of having halo regions in domain decompositions. So by having fewer MPI processes, we reduce the amount of data that's required for these halo regions. We might also be able to exploit additional levels of parallelism using OpenMP as well as MPI. And in general, it's easier to do this by adding OpenMP than trying to do it all in pure MPI, where we might have to overcome some quite severe restrictions imposed by the way that the application was originally designed. So from a software engineering point of view, it might just be quicker and easier to add OpenMP rather than re-engineer the whole MPI code. We might be able to reduce the amount of computation because some MPI codes replicate parts of the computation for convenience reasons. It might be possible to reduce the load imbalance. That's because it's easier and cheaper in general to balance load between threads than it is between processes. And finally, we might be able to reduce the communication costs. It's because we can avoid communicating unused data, which happens in some MPI applications, to make the implementation tractable. We can end up with fewer ranks in MPI collective operations, and we can end up sending fewer, though possibly larger, point-to-point -point messages. However, there are quite a few performance pitfalls which we can run into. Perhaps the most important of these is that most of these hybrid applications are written for simplicity reasons in master-only style. So that means that all the MPI calls are made outside of OpenMP parallel regions. That's simple to implement in general, but from a performance point of view, it means that the OpenMP threads are necessarily idle while MPI communications are taking place. And also, it's not good for locality, because cache misses will occur, for example, if the master thread communicates data that's been written or is going to be read by other threads. Another source of overhead is that implicit point-to-point -point synchronization that happens via MPI messages may be replaced by OpenMP barriers which are actually more expensive. And very loose thread-to-thread -thread synchronization is actually quite hard to do in OpenMP. It's not well supported. In a pure MPI code, 
there will be typically some messages that go inside a node between processes on the same node, so the intranode messages, and other messages that go between nodes, the internode messages. But these two types of messages will often be naturally overlapped in a pure MPI code. In a hybrid code, it turns out to be harder to overlap inter-thread communication with inter-node messages. And that's particularly true if we stick to this master-only style. And then finally, OpenMP can suffer from memory effects such as false sharing and NUMA effects. MPI naturally avoids these. So let's think about what typically happens if we run an experiment where we keep the total number of cores that we're going to dedicate to our application fixed and increase the number of threads per MPI process. So very often what we will find will happen is that the total time spent in MPI communication will reduce. The load imbalance, if there is any, between MPI processes will reduce, and the amount of computation that's done may overall reduce. On the other hand, what we will typically see is that the time spent by threads being idle will increase. Thread synchronization time increases, mostly due to OpenMP barriers. If there's any load imbalance between threads, then that will increase with increasing number of threads. And finally, the use of the memory system may get less efficient because of these problems like false sharing and NUMA effects. I'm going to look at a couple of case studies here. So let me first describe the experimental setup we're using. The hardware is an HPE Cray EX system where each node contains two AMD EPIC chips. Uh, these are 64 core chips and so there's two chips per node giving a total of 128 cores per node. And the memory system has four NUMA regions per socket. So that means there's one NUMA region for every 16 cores. It's also shared L3 caches on this chip, so there's 16 megabytes of L3 cache for every group of four cores. And the system uses HP's Slingshot network. In terms of the software, the MPI library we're using is Cray's MPitch2 variant. The OpenMP library and compiler are, GNU com are provided by the GNU compilers. And the profiling tool we're using is Scholastica. So let me little say a little bit more about the profiling tool. Because Scholastica tracing experiments give us a really nice detailed hierarchical breakdown of MPI and OpenMP overheads. So we can get analyses that look like this where we have a tree-based breakdown that shows where all the ex or our execution time is going in terms of, for example, time spent doing computation versus time spent doing MPI, and that's broken down into different categories. So for this particular example, uh, there's some time spent in collectives, in particular waiting at a barrier. There's some point-to-point -point communication and some of that can be attributed, for example, to uh, waiting because there's a late receive, late receives are being posted. In this case, there's a lot of collective communication. And then there's also the OpenMP overheads. So there's OpenMP management. Um, so in particular, forking parallel regions. And there's also costs for OpenMP synchronization. So in this case, it's mostly threads waiting at a barrier. And then finally, there's also time attributed to idle threads. 
So this is where threads are outside OpenMP parallel regions uh, and therefore doing nothing. The first case study is an uh, application called CASTEP. This is a density functional theory package. And we're running a relatively small benchmark here. And we can see if we plot the execution time versus the number of nodes that we're running on here. And we run the pure MPI code, so that's with one thread per MPI process, that's the dark blue bars here, we can see that we run out of scalability pretty quickly. We get some good improvements from one node to two nodes, but then not much better on four nodes, and then eight and 16 nodes, we've run out of scalability and the application starts running slower. However, if we use hybrid MPI and OpenMP, then the scalability keeps going and we're getting performance improvements, certainly up to eight nodes and just about at 16 nodes as well. So let's use the Scalaska profiling to try and understand what's going on here. So we're going to focus on the case of eight nodes. And what we're doing here is we're showing the total time spent in different aspects of the application. So that, that breakdown that Scalaska gives us, and we're plotting that for different numbers of OpenMP threads per MPI process. And see how these different contributions to the total execution time evolve. So what we can see is that the pure MPI version here, where we've really run out of scalability, and we can see clearly that's because we're spending a lot of time. In fact, something like three quarters of the execution time here is spent in MPI collectives. And for this code, most of this time is in MPI all-to-all -all operations, and these happen inside a 3D FFT library. You can also see that there's still quite a bit of computation going on. And again, a fair amount of this computation is also associated with the 3D FFTs. We can clearly see that as we increase the number of OpenMP threads per MPI process, and therefore reduce the number of MPI processes, that the time spent in the collectives, the purple region here, decreases very dramatically. So by the time we get down to 16 threads per process, we've got 16 times fewer MPI processes contributing to this all-to-all -all operation. And so the total time that takes is greatly reduced. We also see some substantial reduction in the computation as well. We've reduced the the amount of time spent actually doing computing by about 50%. That's all good, but we can also see clearly that because this code is written in master-only style, that the idle threads compensates quite heavily for the increased benefit that we get. So we can see that the time spent in idle threads jumps from obviously nothing to a, about 40% of the execution time. And that's because while the MPI process is doing the MPI collectives and also some of the computation, the other thread here is doing nothing. And even though the MPI time reduces significantly, the total idle time still increases as we increase the number of threads per process. So we can see here that the optimal value is at four threads per process. And despite all the reductions in communication time, the idle time 
is killing uh, is killing our performance as we use more threads. So threads are giving big savings in computing and communication times, and this is largely from the FFT library. But those communications are single threaded, um, so the idle time outweighs savings when we go to eight threads per process or more. Uh, second case study is CoMD. So this is the CoMD proxy application. Uh, this is a classical molecular dynamics simulation using, using link cells. And our test case here is uh, with a three-dimensional volume filled with 128 cubed atoms. So again, if we use Scalaska to do the same sort of profiling, so we're doing the same experiment where we have eight nodes, so that's 1,024 cores, and we vary the number of OpenMP threads per MPI process, we see somewhat less dramatic improvements here, but we can see that if we go from one thread per process to two threads per process, the, the total time goes up a bit, then reduces at four threads and then increases again. So this is a more complicated set of trade-offs that are going on here. So we can see that the, the blue region here, so this is the amount of computation, does reduce somewhat as we increase the number of threads per process. Uh, and this is because the replicated uh, computation in the halo link cells is being gradually avoided as, as we reduce the, the number of MPI processes. The next largest contribution to the overall time for the MPI code is in MPI point-to-point -point communications. And it turns out that uh, if we investigate a little bit further, a lot of this time is actually spent uh, in MPI waiting for communications to arrive. And this is the result of some load imbalance between MPI processes. So what we can see is as we increase the number of threads per process, after two threads per process, the amount of time spent in MPI point to point reduces significantly. And that's because the load becomes better balanced between MPI processes. If we have fewer MPI processes, it turns out that the distribution of atoms to MPI processes becomes more even. However, as we increase the number of threads, we see that the light blue time here, you know, which is due to open MP threads waiting at barriers, increases. So now we're getting load imbalance between OpenMP threads instead of between MPI processes. Uh, and it just turns out for this particular configuration that for four threads per process, both the MPI processes and the OpenMP threads are pretty well balanced. However, as we saw with CASTEP, the thread idle time is the time spent threads doing nothing while uh, MPI process is communicating, and also in this case during some small portion of the computation as well, that time uh, increases as the number of threads goes up. So particularly at by the time we get to eight and 16 threads per process, we get significant amounts of thread idle time which again is slowing the overall time of the application down. So what we see here is that using threads gives some saving in compute time and load balance across processes is being reduced, but eventually some load imbalance across threads appears and the, because of the use of this master only style, idle time also becomes significant. So I hope we've shown you that this type of analysis 
can give some really clear insights into the behavior of hybrid MPI and OpenMP programs and help us identify the performance issues and potential optimization opportunities that there might be in this type of application. Just remains me to say, thank you very much for watching.